Hi, everyone. Thank you, Dan, for that great introduction. Uh, Y'all, I'm so excited to be here. Welcome to the Creative Problem Solving Webinar. Um, I want to give a special shout out to all of you who are here. We have people from all over the world. We have over 70 people joining us. People are here from Canada, Mexico, New Zealand, Istanbul, Brazil, and of course the United States. I just think that's super awesome. Um, so just a little overview of what we're gonna do. This is um, a quick, fast workshop on creative problem solving, and it is fast. Um, we could easily spend a full day or two days on this, but this is just a little bit of a taste. And it's gonna go about an hour, and then at the very end, we'll, we'll close, we'll end it, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So if you wanna stick around after that hour for question and answer, feel free to, and if you don't have questions or wanna jet out, feel free to do that as well. Um, you should, can see on the screen there, uh, my Twitter handle, Facebook, etc. Feel free to tweet about that, the experience you're having. Uh, feel free to connect with me in those arenas if you'd like. All right, so today we're going to do is, this is, hold on here. Um, obviously, we're going to learn about the creative problem solving process. And it's a pretty amazing process, I think. It's been around for about 50, 60 years and has, uh, can be really powerful when it's used well. Um, so we'll talk about that. And we're gonna practice with a real problem today. So in a little while, there'll be an opportunity for some of you to share um, a problem, a situation that you would like new ideas around. And then the rest of us are gonna rally and we're gonna focus on generating ideas for one of your challenges. And the idea is so then you can see how this actually works and then you can replicate this process back with your own folks. So that's our focus today. Definitely will be a little bit interactive as, as much as we can with the webinar. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll play with that once we get there. Just want to give you a little bit of background about me. I mean, Dan shared a few things. Um, I own a company called Climber Consulting, which I have had since 2009. And through that company, I work with teams and organizations to help them be more creative, more innovative. Um, I do creativity training, team development training, leadership development work, um, and work with nonprofits, businesses, universities, you name it, kind of all over the US. Haven't been abroad yet doing that work, but definitely open to it. Um, I also have a weekly podcast that I put out called the, uh, the Deliberate Creative. And if you'd like to listen, it's absolutely free. A new episode comes out every Thursday. Um, if you don't know what a podcast is, it's basically like an online radio show, um, except you can listen anytime you want. Um, so you can go to iTunes or go to my website and just click on podcast. And then I also have this product called Climber Cards, um, which we'll, we'll play with a little bit, and Dan mentioned. All right, so I want to know a little bit more about who's here, who's on this webinar. So if you open up your chat box, um, if you haven't already, go ahead and open that. And I want you to type in your name, where are you located, and what type of work do you do? So are you working, um, do you work on ropes courses? Do you... Um, you know, are you working with adults, with kids, healthcare, whatever? And if you could put all of that in one response, that would be really helpful. Um, great, I see Janny is here, Marin Anderson, Paul Chapman, Nicole, Mandy from Platteville, medical laboratory technician. All right, that's cool. Hey, Kyle from Zeta Tau Alpha, um, New Hampshire. Wow, this is so cool. San Francisco. Okay, we have some experiential educators. No surprise. This is AEE, right? Um, some youth, people doing youth work. Um, Janny from Carlsbad doing team development work. All right, so we have people from all over doing a variety of things. Looks like healthcare, nonprofit adventure company, experiential education, um, zipline company. Hi, Debbie Bartu. Good to see you. Well, health or uh, financial services, Paul from Camp Joy. Hi, Paul. It's kind of fun to see. Um, <laughs> it's kind of fun to see a few people that I know out there. So welcome, those of you that I know and, and those that I don't. Um, all right, some people in hospitality. Uh, somebody, uh, Alea, I don't know if I'm saying your name right, Alea, uh, wrote, no chat box in the app, listening at my day job. Yeah, so if you're on an iPad or an iPhone or um, 
a smartphone, you may only have the Q&A box rather than the chat box, and that's fine. Both work. Um, all right, well, welcome, everyone. It's fun to see who's here. All right, uh, I'm going to try to, you know, as we're, I want to do that because I wanted to see um, what type of work that you do because I wanted to, uh, we'll try to weave some of that in as we go. All right, thanks for the introductions. Next thing we're going to do is this is, uh, we're going to experiment with this. In a moment, I'm going to, um, you're going to see a link in a ch the chat box. And Dan, if you could also put that in the Q&A box. I don't know if that's an option. Um, it, or if you got the email before the webinar, I want you to go to that link that was the Climber Cards app. And what you're going to do is you're going to click on a card that represents your definition of creativity. So let me show you on my screen what that might look like. All right, so you should see a screen like this. Um, here's the address. If you can't find the app, you can also just type, or if you can't find the link, you could also type that in. And I want you to select one of these cards that represents your definition of creativity. And what you'll do is you'll click on the card, and then you're gonna write in your name, and then write in why you chose this. Like, why does that card represent your definition of creativity? So go ahead and do that. And we're going to see the responses in a moment. If you don't have a chat box, again, that web address you can go to for the Climber Cards is right up at the top of my screen. Climbercards.com, or excuse me, climbercards.herokuapp.com slash responses slash new. Ilea, thank you for the phonetic uh, explanation. Welcome. <laughs> All right, let's see if we've got any responses yet. All right, we've gotten, we're getting a few. This is awesome. All right, so you can see some of these responses. It's, uh oh, what happened? My app disappeared for some reason. All right, so here's some of the responses. So just, you could take a moment to read those, read through those. Janie says, it makes me think of ideas growing. They're colorful and beautiful. <laughs> Paul thinks of creativity as an inward spiral, focusing into a single point. Interesting. Con Camel says, solution under pressure, or do I have enough time to do all the creative things I want? <laughs> Lynette says, thinking differently. Yep. Uh, Amy says, gears turning remind me of, reminds me of getting into the creative juices flowing. Love it. Kirsten, as an extrovert, I get energy and ideas from talking with others. Great. All right, this is awesome. I love seeing your responses. All right, it's about seeing things in a new way. Awesome. All right, great. So this is this is just a um, I thought it would be fun to kind of see what other people's definitions of creativity are. Marin says creativity often has a moment of the light bulb when the creative process begins. It's the initial moment that allows the brainstorming process to continue and get even more ideas flowing. Wow, I love that. Really detailed. All right, I'm going to go on back to the slides and we'll talk about creativity here. Okay, so you should see my slides now on the screen. So the first thing I wanna talk about um, is this idea of what is creativity? And this is just a really simple definition. I'm having a little technical difficulty, one second. Creativity is novelty that is valuable. And so this is a definition that's out there in the research literature. And the idea that is that being creative just means you're coming up with something new, but it's also something that's useful. It's something that's valuable. And 
you know, I want to say, you know, valuable, not in the sense of financially valuable, but it, it provides something that's beneficial in some way. So often when I'm in an in-person workshop, uh, we start talking about this, people are like, well, wait a minute. What about like, if I make a painting, is not that creative? That's not necessarily valuable. And I would push back and say, well, actually, maybe it's not valuable from a financial perspective. Maybe I'm not going to sell it necessarily, but there's something, you got something out of it. So there's that process that you went through that that was valuable to go through that process of painting that. Um, and then plus, you know, you have this finished piece that perhaps that's valuable to you. So it's hanging on the wall. Maybe it makes you feel good when you look at it or it reminds you of something. And so valuable in that sense. And I think that that point about valuable is important because creativity, it's not just new and different for new and different sake, but it's something that provides, there's a purpose, there's a meaning, even if that purpose isn't a tangible purpose. Um, and then this, this idea of novelty, try not to think of, you know, those like novelty stores where it's, um, you know, like they sell those like cheap plastic objects. That's often what people think of, at least in the U.S., when they hear the word novelty. Uh, in this case, we mean different. So, um, yeah, that's what we mean by creativity is novelty that is valuable. So think about that. That's our goal today is to come up with some new ideas that are valuable and different. So I'm going to talk through the creative problem-solving process. And I want to give you just a little bit of history of where this came from because um, I think it's helpful to understand some of that background. So in 1948, this guy Alex Osborne published this book called Your Creative Power. And Osborne was one of the founders of the marketing firm BBDO. Uh, in fact, they're still in existence. If you ever watch Mad Men, they're often mentioned as a competitor of that Mad Men firm. But anyway, so he published this book, and this book essentially went viral. I mean, it sold 300,000 copies, which back then was a lot of books. Uh, now we wouldn't think that was quite as special, but... Um, in this book, he explains the creative problem solving process and he also describes brainstorming. And Alex Osborne is credited with inventing brainstorming. And he explains the process that they used in their advertising firm to come up with ideas. And he talks about he gets everybody together and they have a storming of the brains. And he, um, he called that brainstorming. And we're going to talk about today, I'm going to show you some different techniques to come up with ideas besides that typical brainstorming process. And I'll talk about why in a little bit. Anyway, later on in the 50s, Alex Osborne paired up with this guy, Sid Parnes, at Buffalo State University. And together, they did all this research on the creative problem solving process. And since the 50s, the process has been refined and modified. Um, and the process was based on our natural creative problem solving process. Um, so when I show it to you, you may feel like, oh, I've done this before. Yeah, you probably have. The value of understanding it, it then helps us figure out, oh, what am I missing? What steps am I accidentally skipping? Because um, we inevitably will do that. Creative problem solving has been, um, through all this research, we, we have, I guess you could say, proof that it people have generated millions of dollars worth of ideas from creative problem solving. In other words, they came up with an idea through this process, implemented it, and their company either made or saved millions of dollars. One company even reported billion, a billion dollar savings. I don't know. seems like a lot, but it could have happened. Um, so it can be very powerful. And it's not, I don't say that because it's about money, but it could be that you're um, saving lives, that you're impacting kids through an idea that comes up in this process. So, all right, so let's talk about the creative problem solving process. Um, I put this candle up here because creativity does not have to be this magical, mystical, mysterious thing. It can be really straightforward. Um, and I think that you'll see that once we, once we talk through this process. So here it is. This is the creative problem solving process. We start out where we clarify our problem, we come up with ideas for it, we develop some of those ideas, and finally we implement some of the solutions. I'm gonna, we're gonna walk through this four-step process today. Some of you will find, uh, actually, we're gonna spend majority of our time today in the first two stages, clarify and ideate. We'll spend a little, I'll just explain 
implementable. Can actually do those. Of course, we're not going to implement the ideas on this webinar. That would be pretty funny. Um, but what happens in this creative problem solving process is that each of us has, we each have one or more preferences for one of the four areas. So some people love clarifying, some people love ideating, and so forth. Well, what happens, like for instance, I love ideating. That's one of my strengths. And I know that because there's a tool out there called Foresight, which is a thinking profile that helps you figure out which of these areas is your preference. So I love ideating. And because of that, I can pretty easily skip the clarifying process. But if I skip it, then my ideas aren't necessarily always on point. Um, so it's important to go through the process and I think not understanding the whole thing helps you realize like, oh yeah, I need to clarify, even though I don't love doing it. It's important. So, so some of you will enjoy some parts of this more than others. The other thing is that in each of those four stages, there are two types of thinking going on. There's divergent thinking and convergent thinking, or I like to think of them as filling and filtering. So Divergent thinking is when we are taking all these ideas and we are just filling the bucket with as many as we can get. Convergent thinking is that's when we start critically thinking and evaluating and we select the best ideas and we pull them out. The problem with typical brainstorming is that we end up mixing both of these at the same time and it's very ineffective. It is much more effective to separate these types of thinking out do some divergent thinking, and then converge and select the best ideas. Um, in the US at least, I think our, our typical um, education system, we are very good at teaching people how to evaluate and how to be convergent thinkers. We don't do as good of a job at teaching people how to be divergent thinkers. So we'll spend a little time on that. Uh, some of you may have had this experience before where you, you or somebody in your team wants to generate some ideas for a challenge, some issue you have you want to come up with some new solutions for. So maybe in a team meeting, somebody says, okay, here's the issue we have. I just want to spend a little time brainstorming on it. Everyone's like, yeah, okay, sounds good. You know, and so they throw out the issue and then idea one, idea two, idea three gets thrown out. And after around idea three or four, somebody says, Oh yeah, you know, we tried that before about five years ago and it didn't work. So I don't think we should do that. Or maybe they say, yeah, that's going to be way too expensive. We can't do that. But they give some evaluation they give some reason that idea won't work. And usually that's the end of the brainstorming process. And then somebody might say, well, you know, okay, we have three ideas. I idea number two sounds pretty good. What if we explore that? And then it's done. That's not really brainstorming. <laughs> brainstorming is in an hour you're coming up with 150 200 ideas and you're really going divergent and the reason that happens that that scenario I just described is because you're mixing those types of thinking so you want to separate those out so we're gonna work on that today all right we're gonna start off with clarifying so this is that that part of the process where you're really just trying to figure out what the problem is and Einstein has a saying uh, or, or said that if he had an hour to save the world, he would spend 55 minutes figuring out exactly what that problem is and five minutes coming up with the solution. Now we're not gonna follow that exact ratio today, but I think uh, that's important to understand that you really wanna make sure you know what the problem is. Because otherwise you could be coming up with ideas and you implement an idea and it goes beautifully well, but it doesn't solve your problem. That means you didn't spend enough time clarifying. So in order to clarify, um, or at the end of the clarifying process, we, we develop a challenge statement. And that challenge statement really um, sets us up for the rest of the creative problem solving process. And so that challenge statement has, there's three criteria. Uh, we call it the three Bs. And the first B is broad. B is in the letter B. So you want your challenge statement to be fairly broad. Um, what you don't want, this is an example of not a good challenge statement, is I have to get a job with a new employer versus in what ways might I take that next step in my career that provides some reasonable income. So if you have the challenge statement of I have to get a job with a new employer, that means you're ruling out starting your own business. You're ruling out a paid internship. You're ruling out a new job within your same employer. 
perhaps a lateral transfer or promotion. So the way you write your challenge statement impacts the type of ideas you come up with. And that's why you want to be careful of how you write it and make sure you're really getting it, you know, crafted well. All right, so that's broad. And then there's brief. So this would be a good one. How might I help my team be more productive? Versus how might I create a project plan that would help me focus the energy of my team members in a direction that is mutually beneficial? I mean, it's like, it's so long that you can't even barely tell what's going on. So that's not a good challenge statement. So you want to keep it fairly brief. And finally, you want to write it in a beneficial format, so a positive way. So wouldn't it be nice if I could maintain my health versus wouldn't it be nice if I could avoid being sick? Again, the way you write your challenge statement will impact the type of ideas you come up with. So if I have the challenge of wouldn't, I, would be, wouldn't it be nice if I could avoid being sick, one of the ideas that might come up would be, well, just stay at home and never leave your house yeah, you probably wouldn't get sick because you wouldn't be exposed to anything. But I wouldn't say you would be very healthy. Another example, wouldn't it be nice if I had a great relationship with my roommate versus wouldn't it be nice if my roommate and I didn't argue? Well, if you don't want to argue, just don't talk to each other, right? You could just like put a line down the middle of the floor and no one crosses the line or something like that. But that's not a very good relationship. And really, probably what you're wanting to do is, is have a better relationship and a better way of living together. So the way you write your challenge statement impacts the type of ideas you come up with. So here are some examples of challenge statements that would work well. I'm just going to stop talking and let you all take a moment to read those. Mm. Uh, I just realized the acronym IWWM. In what ways might we develop our participants' creativity? Um, the creative problem solving process. There's there's this whole culture around it, and that's one of the acronyms they use. So sorry, I actually meant to write that out. <laughs> I missed it. So you'll notice the beginning of the challenge statement. Um, they always start in certain ways. And here's some examples. These are some sentence stems of how the challenge statement always will almost always begin with one of these. How to, in what ways might, wouldn't it be nice if, how might, I wish, it would be great if, etc. And that writing it in that way, for one, it helps it be helps it be that beneficial, uh, meet that criteria. Um, it also just helps it be written in like kind of an open way that we're, we're generating lots of ideas, not an idea, we're many ideas. So you want to write your challenge statement using one of those, uh, one of those sentence stems and also make it a broad, brief and beneficial. All right. So now we're going to start. This is the, this is where you all get to do some work, get to do some interaction. So I want you to come up with a challenge statement for any problem that you have, However, it needs to meet a couple criteria. One, it needs to be appropriate to share on this webinar. Um, two, it needs to be something where you need creative ideas for. You know, sometimes we have problems. We actually know exactly how to solve them. It's just a matter of doing it. That's not so helpful for right now. We're looking for something you need creative ideas for. And what you're going to do is you're going to write your challenge statement in our shared Google Doc. And um, we're going to put a link up there in the chat box if you have access to that. Otherwise, it's, it was sent in the email before the webinar began, and you could go there. And so I'm going to go there now. If you don't have access to it, don't worry. I'll have it displayed on my, uh, on my machine. Um, it just means you won't be able to type anything in, but that's OK. All right, so you should see a Google Doc that looks like this. If you're able to see it, if you're on that Google Doc, whoops, sorry, it should look like this. Uh, if you could just, looks like a few people are on there. Oh, awesome. I was going to say type a yes in the chat box, but we can actually tell there's people on there. All right, so hold on. Uh, before you start typing, stop, back up. Um, <laughs> If you could type down here, um, so not above the word clarify, but underneath, 
where it says, in what ways might we serve more people through our ropes course program? So that's one example. Just go ahead and type in whatever your challenge statement is, and let's see what we can get. Go ahead. Hopefully this will work for all of us typing at the same time. <laughs> it's going to be a little crazy. Make sure you're typing on a new line all by yourself. I don't know if this is going to work to have 70 people in a Google Doc all at once. <laughs> all right, we're getting a few. This is great. When, when, you're, when your statement's done, just put a period or something so we know you're done typing. Uh, or I guess it's actually a question mark because it is a question. Um, so in what ways might Splore, that must be a name of a program, in what ways might Splore create weekly programs for participants who age out of state programs? Oh, that's interesting. That's a good question. Um, Another one we have is how to create financial equity in our program offerings for all of our students slash families with very diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. Interesting, yeah. In what ways can we create more revenue for venture out through other oh, not done typing? Um, in what ways can we engage the upper management in helping build our culture? How to better engage adults in playful activities? How might we hold staff accountable? Oops. How might we hold staff accountable without them feeling like we are picking on them? <laughs> How can we utilize technology to benefit students in career development? Great. All right, these are good. Um, yeah, keep going if you're still typing. Keep going. I'm looking for one that we can focus on in the next 15 minutes or so as a group, one that would be something that we all could understand. Um, if you have one that you're thinking, oh, I'm not sure if, if everyone would understand this, uh, maybe put in parentheses a little bit about your program. Is this a ropes course program? Are you working in a bank? Like, give us just like a little bit of information. And I'll just add too that that is part of the clarifying process is that you're really getting a lot of background information about the challenge. Um, and we're not spending a lot of time on that today. Um, but it might be where, you know, before you go into coming up with ideas, you look at what's been done in the past. You look at some statistics. You're looking at, you know, what, you're just getting all sorts of data, essentially, so you can really fully understand what are we dealing with here. Um, yeah, so that's a part of the part of the clarifying process. Oh, I love this. How to break into family business consulting using using experiential training. Yeah, that's a great question. All these are great. <laughs> How might I go about opening my restaurant when I have no previous entrepreneur experience? People do that all the time, so that's a good question. So this one, this one is interesting. Um, about how to create financial equity in our program offerings for all of our students and families with diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. So who, whoever wrote this, uh, if you want, you can type your name in there. I don't know who you are. Uh, Marin, oh, Marin Anderson, thank you. Um, I hope I'm saying your name right, Marin. 
So Marvin provided us a little bit of detail, which might make this a good one for us to focus on. So this is a school that has a week-long program where all students are participating in it. And the program and activity offerings range from free to students for up to $2,000 for international travel. So they offer some financial aid or financial aid for some students if they qualify, but we're still not there. And Mara, when you say we're still not there, do you mean we still can't offer programs for everybody? She's typing. Okay, so she's saying that they don't feel like they can offer these programs that cost money to some students because they shy away from the cost. Um, all right. Oh, okay, so the students are shying away from the cost without even thinking about applying for financial aid. So it sounds like that part of the issue is that, it, that it's more of like perception. So it sounds like it's less about raising money, but it's more about how do we help students understand that this offering is out there. Is that right, Marin? Exactly, she wrote. Okay, great. So, um, all right, so let's spend some time on that. I'm going to retype this down here under the ideate. All right, well, welcome everyone. It's fun to see who's here. All right. All right, uh, I'm going to try to, you know, as we're, I want to do that because I wanted to see um, what type of work that you do because I wanted to, uh, we'll try to weave some of that in as we go. All right, thanks for the introductions. Next thing we're going to do is this is, uh, we're going to experiment with this. In a moment, I'm going to, um, you're going to see a link in a ch the chat box. And Dan, if you could also put that in the Q&A box. I don't know if that's an option. Um, it, or if you got the email before the webinar, I want you to go to that link that was the Climber Cards app. And what you're going to do is you're going to click on a card that represents your definition of creativity. So let me show you on my screen what that might look like. All right, so you should see a screen like this. Um, here's the address. If you can't find the app, you can also just type, or if you can't find the link, you could also type that in. And I want you to select one of these cards that represents your definition of creativity. And what you'll do is you'll click on the card and then you're gonna write in your name and then write in why you chose this. Like why does that card represent your definition of creativity? So go ahead and do that. And then we're gonna see the responses in a moment. All right, let's see if we've got any responses yet. All right, we've gotten, we're getting a few, this is awesome. All right, so you can see some of these responses. Janie says, it makes me think of ideas growing. They're colorful and beautiful. <laughs> Paul thinks of creativity as an inward spiral, focusing into a single point. Interesting. Con Camel says, solution under pressure, or do I have enough time to do all the creative things I want? <laughs> Lynette says, thinking differently. Yep. Uh, Amy says, gears turning remind me, reminds me of getting into the creative juices flowing. Love it. Kirsten, as an extrovert, I get energy and ideas from talking with others. Great. All right, this is awesome. I love seeing your responses. All right, it's about seeing things in a new way. Awesome. All right, great. So this is, this is just a, um, I thought it would be fun to kind of see what other people's definitions of creativity are. Marin says, creativity often has a moment of the light bulb when the creative process begins. It's the initial moment that allows the brainstorming process to continue and get even more ideas flowing. Wow, I love that, really detailed. All right, I'm gonna go on back to the slides and we'll talk about creativity here. Okay, so you should see my slides now on the screen. So the first thing I wanna talk about um, is this idea of what is creativity? And this is just a really simple definition. I'm having a little technical difficulty, one second. Creativity is novelty that is valuable. And so this is a definition that's out there in the research literature. And the idea that is that being creative just means you're coming up with something new, but it's also something that's useful. It's something that's valuable. And, it, you know, I want to say, you know, valuable, not in the sense of financially valuable, 
but it, it provides something that's beneficial in some way. So often when I'm in an in-person workshop, uh, we start talking about this, people are like, well, wait a minute, what about like if I make a painting, is not that creative? That's not necessarily valuable. And I would push back and say, well, actually, maybe it's not valuable from a financial perspective. Maybe you're not going to sell it necessarily, but there's something, you got something out of it. So there's that process that you went through that that was valuable to go through that process of painting that. Um, and then plus, you know, you have this finished piece that perhaps that's valuable to you. So it's hanging on the wall. Maybe it makes you feel good when you look at it or it reminds you of something. And so valuable in that sense. And I think that that point about valuable is important because creativity, it's not just new and different for new and different sake, but it's something that provides, there's a purpose, there's a meaning, even if that purpose isn't a tangible purpose. Um, and then this, I have this idea of novelty, try not to think of, you know, those like novelty stores where it's, um, you know, like they sell those like cheap plastic objects. That's often what people think of, at least in the U.S., when they hear the word novelty. Uh, in this case, we mean different. So, um, yeah, that's what we mean by creativity is novelty that is valuable. So think about that. That's our goal today is to come up with some new ideas that are valuable and different. So I'm going to talk through the creative problem solving process. And I want to give you just a little bit of history of where this came from, because um, I think it's helpful to understand some of that background. So in 1948, this guy, Alex Osborne, published this book called Your Creative Power. And Osborne was one of the founders of the marketing firm BBDO. Uh, in fact, they're still in existence. If you ever watch Mad Men, they're often mentioned as a competitor of that Mad Men firm. But anyway, so he published this book, and this book essentially went viral. I mean, it sold 300,000 copies, which back then was a lot of books. Uh, now we wouldn't think that was quite as special, but... Um, in this book, he explains the creative problem solving process and he also describes brainstorming. And Alex Osborne is credited with inventing brainstorming. And he explains the process that they used in their advertising firm to come up with ideas. And he talks about he gets everybody together and they have a storming of the brains. And he, um, he called that brainstorming. And we're going to talk about today, I'm going to show you some different techniques to come up with ideas besides that typical brainstorming process. And I'll talk about why in a little bit. Anyway, later on in the 50s, Alex Osborne paired up with this guy, Sid Parnes, at Buffalo State University. And together, they did all this research on the creative problem solving process. And since the 50s, the process has been refined and modified. Um, and the process was based on our natural creative problem solving process. Um, so when I show it to you, you may feel like, oh, I've done this before. Yeah, you probably have. The value of understanding it, it then helps us figure out, oh, what am I missing? What steps am I accidentally skipping? Because um, we inevitably will do that. Creative problem solving has been, um, through all this research, we, we have, I guess you could say, proof that it people have generated millions of dollars worth of ideas from creative problem solving. In other words, they came up with an idea through this process, implemented it, and their company either made or saved millions of dollars. One company even reported billion, a billion dollar savings. I don't know. It seems like a lot, but it could have happened. Um, so it can be very powerful. And it's not, and I don't say that because it's about money, but it could be that you're um, saving lives, that you're impacting kids through an idea that comes up in this process. So, all right, so let's talk about the creative problem solving process. Um, I put this candle up here because creativity does not have to be this magical, mystical, mysterious thing. It can be really straightforward. Um, and I think that you'll see that once we, once we talk through this process. So here it is. This is the creative problem solving process. We start out where we clarify our problem, we come up with ideas for it, we develop some of those ideas, and finally we implement some of the solutions. I'm gonna, we're gonna walk through this four-step process today. Some of you will find, uh, actually, we're gonna spend majority of our time today in the first two stages, clarify and ideate. We'll spend a little, I'll just explain I'm not going to actually do those. Of course, I'm not going to implement the ideas on this webinar. That would be pretty funny. Um, 
But what happens in this creative problem solving process is that each of us has, we each have one or more preferences for one of the four areas. So some people love clarifying, some people love ideating and so forth. Well, what happens, like for instance, I love ideating. That's one of my strengths. And I know that because there's a tool out there called Foresight, which is a thinking profile that helps you figure out which of these areas is your preference. So I love ideating. And because of that, I can pretty easily skip the clarifying process. But if I skip it, then my ideas aren't necessarily always on point. Um, so it's important to go through the process and I think not understanding the whole thing helps you realize like, oh yeah, I need to clarify, even though I don't love doing it. It's important. So, so some of you will enjoy some parts of this more than others. The other thing is that in each of those four stages, there are two types of thinking going on. There's divergent thinking and convergent thinking, or I like to think of them as filling and filtering. So Divergent thinking is when we are taking all these ideas and we are just filling the bucket with as many as we can get. Convergent thinking is that's when we start critically thinking and evaluating and we select the best ideas and we pull them out. The problem with typical brainstorming is that we end up mixing both of these at the same time and it's very ineffective. It is much more effective to separate these types of thinking out do some divergent thinking, and then converge and select the best ideas. Um, in the U.S. at least, I think our, our typical um, education system, we are very good at teaching people how to evaluate and how to be convergent thinkers. We don't do as good of a job at teaching people how to be divergent thinkers. So we'll spend a little time on that. Uh, some of you may have had this experience before where you, you or somebody in your team wants to generate some ideas for a challenge, some issue you have you want to come up with some new solutions for. So maybe in a team meeting, somebody says, okay, here's the issue we have. I just want to spend a little time brainstorming on it. Everyone's like, yeah, okay, sounds good. You know, and so they throw out the issue and then idea one, idea two, idea three gets thrown out. And after around idea three or four, somebody says, oh yeah, you know, we tried that before about five years ago and it didn't work, so I don't think we should do that. Or maybe they say, yeah, that's going to be way too expensive, we can't do that. But they give some evaluation, they give some reason that idea won't work, and usually that's the end of the brainstorming process. And then somebody might say, well, you know, okay, we have three ideas. I idea number two sounds pretty good, what if we explore that? And then it's done. That's not really brainstorming. <laughs> brainstorming is in an hour you're coming up with 150 200 ideas and you're really going divergent and the reason that happens that that scenario I just described is because you're mixing those types of thinking so you want to separate those out so we're gonna work on that today all right we're gonna start off with clarifying so this is that that part of the process where you're really just trying to figure out what the problem is and Einstein has a saying uh, or, or said that if he had an hour to save the world, he would spend 55 minutes figuring out exactly what that problem is and five minutes coming up with the solution. Now we're not gonna follow that exact ratio today, but I think uh, that's important to understand that you really wanna make sure you know what the problem is. Because otherwise you could be coming up with ideas and you implement an idea and it goes beautifully well, but it doesn't solve your problem. That means you didn't spend enough time clarifying. So in order to clarify, um, or at the end of the clarifying process, we, we develop a challenge statement. And that challenge statement really um, sets us up for the rest of the creative problem solving process. And so that challenge statement has, there's three criteria. Uh, we call it the three Bs. And the first B is broad. B is in the letter B. So you want your challenge statement to be fairly broad. Um, what you don't want, this is an example of not a good challenge statement, is I have to get a job with a new employer versus in what ways might I take that next step in my career that provides some reasonable income. So if you have the challenge statement of I have to get a job with a new employer, that means you're ruling out starting your own business. You're ruling out a paid internship. You're ruling out a new job within your same employer, perhaps a lateral transfer or promotion. So the way you write your challenge statement impacts the type of ideas you come up with 
And that's why you want to be careful of how you write it and make sure you're really getting it, you know, crafted well. All right, so that's broad. And then there's brief. So this would be a good one. How might I help my team be more productive? Versus how might I create a project plan that would help me focus the energy of my team members in a direction that's mutually beneficial? I mean, it's like, it's so long that you can't even barely tell what's going on. So that's not a good challenge statement. So you want to keep it fairly brief. And finally, you want to write it in a beneficial format, so a positive way. So wouldn't it be nice if I could maintain my health versus wouldn't it be nice if I could avoid being sick? Again, the way you write your challenge statement will impact the type of ideas you come up with. So if I have the challenge of wouldn't, I, would be, wouldn't it be nice if I could avoid being sick, one of the ideas that might come up would be, well, just stay at home and never leave your house yeah, you probably wouldn't get sick because you wouldn't be exposed to anything. But I wouldn't say you would be very healthy. Another example, wouldn't it be nice if I had a great relationship with my roommate versus wouldn't it be nice if my roommate and I didn't argue? Well, if you don't want to argue, just don't talk to each other, right? You could just like put a line down the middle of the floor and no one crosses the line or something like that. But that's not a very good relationship. And really, probably what you're wanting to do is, is have a better relationship and a better way of living together. So the way you write your challenge statement impacts the type of ideas you come up with. So here are some examples of challenge statements that would work well. I'm just going to stop talking and let you all take a moment to read those. Mm. Uh, I just realized the acronym IWWM, in what ways might we develop our participants' creativity? Um, the creative problem solving process, there's, there's this whole culture around it and that's one of the acronyms they use. So, sorry, I actually meant to write that out. <laughs> I missed it. So you'll notice the beginning of the challenge statement um, they always start in certain ways. And here's some examples. These are some sentence stems of how the challenge statement always will almost always begin with one of these. How to, in what ways might, wouldn't it be nice if, how might, I wish, it would be great if, et cetera. And that writing it in that way, for one, it helps it be, helps it be that beneficial, uh, meet that criteria. Um, it also just helps it be written in like kind of an open way that we're, we're generating lots of ideas, not an idea, we're many ideas. So you want to write your challenge statement using one of those, uh, one of those sentence stems and also make it at broad, brief and beneficial. All right. So now we're going to start. This is the, this is where you all get to do some work, get to do some interaction. So once you two come up with a challenge statement for any problem that you have, However, it needs to meet a couple criteria. One, it needs to be appropriate to share on this webinar. Um, two, it needs to be something where you need creative ideas for. You know, sometimes we have problems. We actually know exactly how to solve them. It's just a matter of doing it. That's not so helpful for right now. We're looking for something you need creative ideas for. And what you're going to do is you're going to write your challenge statement in our shared Google Doc. And um, we're going to put a link up there in the chat box if you have access to that. Otherwise, it's, it was sent in the email before the webinar began, and you could go there. And so I'm going to go there now. If you don't have access to it, don't worry. I'll have it displayed on my, uh, on my machine. Um, it just means you won't be able to type anything in, but that's okay. All right, so you should see a Google Doc that looks like this. If you're able to see it, if you're on that Google Doc, whoops, sorry, it should look like this. Uh, if you could just, looks like a few people are on there. Oh, awesome, I was gonna say type a yes in the chat box, but we can actually tell there's people on there. All right, so hold on, uh, before you start typing, stop, back up. Um, <laughs> if you could type down here, um, so not above the word clarify, but underneath, where it says, in what ways might we serve more people through our ropes course program? So that's one example. Just go ahead and type in whatever your challenge statement is, and let's see what we can get. Go ahead. Hopefully this will work for all of us typing at the same time. 
<laughs> it's gonna be a little crazy. Make sure you're typing on a new line all by yourself. I don't know if this is gonna work. I have 70 people in a Google Doc all at once. So in what ways might Splore, that must be a name of a program, in what ways might Splore create weekly programs for participants who age out of state programs? Oh, that's interesting. That's a good question. Um, Another one we have is how to create financial equity in our program offerings for all of our students slash families with very diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. Interesting. Yeah. In what ways can we create more revenue for venture out through other oh, not done typing? Um, in what ways can we engage the upper management in helping build our culture? How to better engage adults in playful activities. How might we hold staff accountable? How might we hold staff accountable without them feeling like we are picking on them? <laughs> How can we utilize technology to benefit students in career development? Great. All right, these are good. Um, yeah, keep going if you're still typing. Keep going. I'm looking for one that we can focus on in the next 15 minutes or so as a group, one that would be something that we all could understand. If you have one that you're thinking, oh, I'm not sure if, if everyone would understand this, uh, maybe put in parentheses a little bit about your program. Is this a ropes course program? Are you working at a bank? Like, give us just like a little bit of information. And I'll just add too that that is part of the clarifying process is that you're really getting a lot of background information about the challenge. Um, and we're not spending a lot of time on that today, um, but it might be where, you know, before you go into coming up with ideas, you look at what's been done in the past, you look at some statistics, you're looking at, you know, what, you're just getting all sorts of data, essentially, so you can really fully understand what are we dealing with here. Um, yeah, so that's a part of the, part of the clarifying process. Oh, I love this. How to break into family business consulting using using experiential training? Yeah, that's a good question. All these are great. <laughs> How might I go about opening my restaurant when I have no previous entrepreneur experience? People do that all the time, so that's a good question. So this one, this one is interesting. Um, about how to create financial equity in our program offerings for all of our students and families with diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. So who, whoever wrote this, uh, if you want, you can type your name in there. I don't know who you are. Uh, Marin, oh, Marin Anderson, thank you. Um, I hope I'm saying your name right, Marin. So Marin provided us a little bit of detail, which might make this a good one for us to focus on. So this is a school that has a week-long program where all students are participating in it. And the program and activity offerings range from free to students for up to $2,000 for international travel. So they offer some financial aid or financial aid for some students if they qualify, but we're still not there. And Mara, when you say we're still not there, do you mean we still can't offer programs for everybody? She's typing. Okay, so she's saying that they don't feel like they can offer these programs that cost money to some students because they shy away from the cost. Um, all right. Oh, okay, so the students are shying away from the cost without even thinking about applying for financial aid. So it sounds like that part of the issue is that, it, that it's more of a perception. So it sounds like it's less about raising money, but it's more about how do we help students understand that this offering is out there. Is that right, Marin? Exactly, she wrote. Okay, great. So, um, all right, so let's spend some time on that. I'm going to retype this down here under the ideate. Um, Sorry, whoever wrote this, 
how do I find the money to start my own experiential ed center? I'm going to just move that up here. Oh, I see you already did. Oh, nice. Um, all right, so here's the challenge statement. Um, Mara, tell me what you think. How to how to raise awareness of the scholarship slash financial aid that our school has for student programs. Okay, Marn Wright, that's wrote is writing. That sounds good. The other part of the problem is is are we offering the right things? Is is it right? Is it right that we should be offering? Okay. Yeah, okay. So there there's there's two questions there. We're gonna just focus on this one. And so that I'm I'm glad you actually brought up this other piece of like, oh wait, there's this other piece. When you're when you're going through the creative problem solving process, it's helpful to focus on one thing at a time. So we're gonna generate ideas on how to raise awareness of this scholarship uh, slash financial aid that our school has for student programs like how do we get the students more aware of that more excited about it that's the issue later you could go through this process again um, where you have this other question you know of are we even asking the right the or, or do we have the, even the right offerings and then you could decide well which of those should come before the other because um, sometimes you know you do it the creative problem solving process for one challenge and then it may or may not, you may or may not need it for the second piece, depending on what you come up with. Um, all right, great, she says, cool. Um, okay, so we're gonna go back to the slides and then we're gonna come back and generate ideas in a minute. Okay, so we just finished the clarifying process. That was super fast. <laughs> Normally I would recommend spending a, a couple hours on it at minimum. Um, but but sometimes even you're spending you know a half day or or a full day uh, on that that clarifying process or even longer. It really depends on what the challenge is and what you're trying to do. Um, however, at the same time, sometimes just doing some quick and dirty, like all right, 20 minutes, let's get this done, let's go into some ideas. Um, you know, it just depends on what your challenge is. All right, so stage two, ideate. Here's where you're generating ideas that answer that question. So before we start, there's some very important guidelines that you need to follow. So this may sound funny that why would there be rules for brainstorming? Wouldn't that, shouldn't creativity just be about like not having any rules? And actually, people tend to be more creative when there are some parameters. Uh, so it's one of the many myths out there about creativity. So these are the divergent thinking guidelines. So the first one is you're going to suspend judgment. So I just and, and that that includes judgment of ourselves. Often we have these ideas I'm like, oh, I'm not saying that out loud. That's really stupid. Just get it off your chest. Just say it. Just type it. Whatever. Um, what happens is if you don't say it, then it gets in the way and it prevents you from coming up with another idea. So you want to suspend that judgment and get your ideas out there. We're looking for wild and crazy ideas. I mean, maybe you need to host a little. Uh, and that and bring an elephant in and I mean, I don't know you want to get wild and crazy the other thing you want to do is combine and build on ideas so if somebody if two people share two different ideas you know a third person might say oh yeah what if we take both of those and we make this one twist and we do this awesome what you don't want to do is own the ideas the ideas belong to the group and you just let them be part of the for the group and we're also going for quantity um, so we want to get as many ideas as we can. I would bet with all these people on this webinar, we could easily get 150 ideas pretty fast because if everybody shared two ideas, wow. Uh, but if you're doing this in person, um, yeah, it, it just depends on how long, but you could easily get 100 ideas an hour, uh, depending on how many people you have and, and the, you know, what the issue is. But you want to go for quantity. Obviously, you're not going to use all But the uh, baking process. All right, so how we're going to do this today is we're going to do a little brain writing process because we can't really do it verbally. Um, and actually, brain writing is really a good start anyway. Um, if you want, you can go ahead over to the Google Doc and just quickly start writing ideas in that ID8 section. And I'm just going to explain a couple things more. If you're doing this in person, 
I am a big fan of post-it notes. I go through a lot of post notes in an ideation session. And I, everybody gets a, uh, you know, a little post-it pad and I tell them, write down ideas as fast as you can, one idea per post-it note. And usually I give them a, a marker, like a thin marker, like say a Sharpie, um, be, for two reasons. One, I want those ideas to be readable if we post them on a wall. So I put them up on the wall and if I'm standing three, four feet away, I want to be able to read the ideas. The second is with a marker, you can only go in so much detail. So, you know, the idea should just be a sentence long or something. It doesn't need to be a huge, well-developed idea. Um, I use brain writing all the time. Um, and, and, and then, you know, once you have them up, everybody's, you know, maybe give everyone time to write five ideas. So maybe that's, you know, five minutes, seven minutes or something. And then start verbally sharing the ideas. And people can share their own idea verbally, like say the idea and then post the post-it note up on a wall. Or um, depending on the situation, you could have them all up there and then sort of do a little gallery walk where everybody's reading them. But somehow you want to get everybody reading the ideas or hearing the ideas. Um, I also like to start with writing first because um, it helps people think. Not everybody is good at generating the ideas verbally really fast. And I think that in the classic brainstorming, that's what we do. And then some people you know, they're just, they don't think that fast. They don't think that way. Maybe they're more introverted or, um, so that's one problem with sharing the ideas verbally. The other is that it can actually make the group go in a certain direction that may not be the best direction. And sometimes when you just start quietly writing the ideas by yourself, it makes it a little easier, um, to share or to, excuse me, it makes it a little easier to come up with like some unique and really different ideas. All right, so I'm gonna go over to that Google Doc and let's see what, what we have going on over there. Oops. <laughs> this is great, we're definitely getting creative. Skywriting, <laughs> I love it. All right, we've got all sorts of ideas coming on here. Uh, be where the students are, Instagram, Twitter. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Offer some food. Just ask everyone. I don't know how big the school is, but just ask everyone if they know about this. Talk about the parents. Do a free training online first. A short course is free for everyone. Then at the end, share info about um, how they can access more for free or not free because you need some people to pay. Cool. Have a time that people walk these kids through the assistance program so it's not overwhelming and confusing. Support them in the process. That's a great point. Yeah, all these are really good. Raffle. Yeah, keep them coming, y'all. If you're not over there on the Google Doc and you have access to it, go over to the Google Doc and see if you can type in some ideas for Maran for how to raise awareness of the scholarship slash financial aid that our school has for the students. Um, so the challenge is that the students don't necessarily know about the scholarship and the financial aid process that they have, and they want to raise the awareness to the students. Great, we've got some more here. Um, have a recruiter who's been through the program, talk with students, a newsletter article, testimonial or letter from previous students, create contests like poster contests, writing contests, have the students who understand create surveys they can give each other. Um, it looks like you all are already doing this without me having said it, but make sure you're doing one idea per line. Um, if we didn't have so many people on this document at the same time, what would be ideal is actually to number, number all these, and we could do that afterwards. Um, it's really helpful anytime you're coming up with ideas to number them, because then everybody can see, oh wow, okay, we're at 45, like great, let's do five more and get to 50. Um, all right, I'm gonna, oh, sorry, 150. Um, I'm gonna go back to the slides and show you a couple other ways to come up with ideas. It looks like we could get a little more wild and crazy with these ideas. All right, so the next technique, so we just did some brain writing. So the next technique is something called associations. And this is where you're looking at images and or, or anything, objects, and you're getting ideas for how to solve the challenge based on what you see. 
So up on the screen, there's a bunch of images of climber cards. Those might prompt some ideas for you. But also just like look around the space that you're in. Um, like I've got this pile of paintbrushes over there. Like what idea could come out of a paintbrush? Maybe we paint a mural for this, this uh, to highlight this. Uh, maybe like get some graffiti artists in there or, or kids, like have the kids do a graffiti mural to help highlight the scholarship process. Uh, but you get the idea where, you know, I look at the paintbrush and that sparked this idea to paint a mural, graffiti, whatever. It might be, that was like a fairly linear idea, but it could be something, you know, more metaphorical or, you know, maybe looking at the elephant makes you think about uh, creating some mnemonics because, you know, we have this idea that elephants never forget and that lead, leads to memory and, you know, so forth. So associations are another tool you can use. So looking at those images, look around the space, keep coming up with ideas, keep putting them in Google Doc. And I'll give you a minute to do that and then we're going to go on to a third technique. Oh, these are great. Interview students and find their exact words to address their obstacles in joining your program. And then exact words is in all caps. <laughs> Let's get wild and crazy, y'all. I want, I want to see some really weird ideas out there. International food night, uh, video applications instead of a paper application. Hmm. Having the alums do a phone tree. Awesome. All right. I'm going to share one more technique for coming up with ideas. And this technique is called SCAMPER. And SCAMPER is an acronym. And the purpose of it is to, um, again, just help you get more wild, more crazy, more unique, more novel with your ideas. I mean, that's what creativity is all about. And the way you use SCAMPER is, um, first it stands for substitute, combine, adapt, Modify, maximize, minimize, put to other uses, eliminate, or reverse. And so you might take an existing idea that's already up there, and then you might substitute something, or you might combine some ideas. Or what if you took an idea that was up there and you made it, you maximized it, you made it gigantic, or maybe you made it really miniature and really tiny. Um, so see if you can come up with some ideas using one of these seven um, verbs here, I guess. Is there a way you can modify, minimize, eliminate? What if you take out a piece? What if you, for instance, like what if you didn't have an application process? Hmm, then what, how would you come up with, uh, how would you find the students? What if you just eliminated the process completely? Uh, or what if you reverse the process? What if they applied after they went on the program? And I, I know some of you are wanting to like evaluate these ideas already. Like, oh no, that would never work. Hold off on the converging. All right, we're gonna take one more look at our list of ideas and then we're gonna move on to the next stage of the process. I love it. Have dogs walk around with signs about the scholarships. Most people love to pet a friendly dog and will read the sign. I love it. And especially on a, a school campus, right? Oh, or substitute elephants for dogs. This is, now see, this is getting good. This is what we're looking for. And you'll see that, you know, initially the ideas that came up, I mean, they were fine, but they weren't necessarily highly creative. You know, Instagram, Twitter, yeah, okay, yeah, social media, great idea. But Oh, but getting some dogs out there or offering camel rides, which is up there, you know, now we're getting really interesting. And when you're leading a creative problem solving process, it takes time to get into that higher level, or I shouldn't say higher level, it takes time to get into, um, you know, those more interesting and innovative ideas. All right. You all feel free to keep working on those ideas if you want. I know Marin will love it. Um, and Marin will we'll leave this page up for you so you can copy all these later. All right, I'm gonna go on and just breeze through really fast the last two stages of the program or the uh, problem solving process. Um, so at the end, after you have all these ideas, you have to select the best ones. And so that's the converging piece. And sometimes you really can just simply pick. Um, it doesn't have to be a highly complicated process. You could just pick, okay, let's say five ideas. And there's some other ways to evaluate which ones you might choose, but um, let's just imagine you picked five ideas. 
Then what you're going to do is you're going to take those five ideas and you're going to develop them further. You're going to evaluate them and really strengthen them to figure out how do we take this idea and tweak it to be the best fit for our specific issue. And this is where you're moving really from this general idea to a true solution. And one way you can do that is something called the point technique, where you're looking at pluses of the idea, opportunity, issues, and generating the key to solve those issues. And we're not gonna, we don't have time to do that today, but that's a tool that you can use. And then once you've done that, your next step, of course, is to implement the ideas. And a part of that implementation is really figuring out, you know, exploring that acceptance. So let's say we take this dog idea where you're having these little billboards on the dogs or something and they walk, walk around campus. A part of that, of course, is going to be get the administration to accept, hey, can we have dogs on campus for this day, for this special event? Um, and so, but you, it, it can be helpful to develop the idea a little bit further before you start really exploring the acceptance. Um, anyway. I think this implementation is, is often what holds people up, is they get, they get this far and then they don't actually do anything with it. You know, it's really rare to talk to an artist, a writer, a scientist who doesn't have more ideas. But it's this implementation, I think, that really sets people apart. And this sets apart, you know, the, the Einsteins from the rest of the world, uh, or the highly creatives from the rest of us. So d don't give up on the implementation, because it is hard work. It takes time. So just a quick review, here are the four stages of the creative problem solving process. Um, clarify, ideate, develop, and implement. So I wanna give you a few resources because we, we just breeze through that really fast. Um, the first is my podcast called The Deliberate Creative. Episodes number three through eight walk through the entire creative problem solving process. Um, so feel free to go listen to that. And then there's even some more recent episodes that I think you would find very helpful. Um, you can subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher, or you can just go right to ClamorConsulting.com and listen there. Also, you saw the Climber Cards app. It is not necessarily available for the public yet, but what is available are these uh, physical cards. Uh, they're 20 bucks. They're awesome. I, I, I just hear like these amazing stories of how people have used them. Uh, so you can go out, order those online, and they usually ship out the same day or the next day, so you'll get them pretty quick. I also have some free ebooks. Um, I have two ebooks. One is an ebook for Climber Cards, and you can just go to climbercards.com and download it for free. Uh, there's all these different ways to use the deck, and quite honestly, the book is valuable even if you don't have Climber Cards because you can use some other types of cards. Um, and then I also have a creative problem solving uh, ebook that was emailed out ahead of time, um, and you can also get that if you go to the website on episodes three through seven, there's a link to that book. So it's a little bit hidden, but, um, but you can find it. Or just email me, I can help you. And if you download either of those eBooks, you'll get signed up for my newsletter, which I send out occasionally. I want to do that way. Uh, but anyway, some polls and some information will be shared with you. So um, I want to just do a final little closing. I would be curious to hear, um, type in the chat box, how will you use the creative problem solving process? I know we just breeze through it really fast, but how can you imagine using it? By the way, Marin wrote in the chat box, a big all caps, thank you. So thank you. And then she also wrote, working with all my committees to come up with challenge statements for each of my programs. Awesome. Uh, Eric wrote, I hate to clarify, I will refocus on this part to help with the rest of the process. <laughs> Eric, I can relate. <laughs> John wrote, to launch our new consulting business. Woohoo! Awesome, John. I'm always excited when I hear about people starting a new business. Dan wrote, to clarify the part of the process where you're not allowed to shut down ideas, divergent thinking. Yes. You know, one thing I would add is that those divergent thinking guidelines, put them on a poster up on the wall or somehow have them visible so everybody can see them while you're doing the brainstorming process. Uh, that can just be really helpful. Um, all right, I see a lull in the responses. So we're gonna go ahead and say, thank you everyone. Um, I'm gonna stick around for a little while. If you wanna have, uh, I'll, I'll be around for a while for Q and A if you wanna ask questions or talk a little more. 
Um, feel free to follow me on Twitter, like my Facebook page, and definitely check out the Deliberate Creative podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and bye for everybody that's hanging up. And for everyone that's staying, just hang out for a moment. <laughs>